Welcome back to the LMU History Department's Summer Web Social Media Series, Viral Histories. Viral Histories is an online version of our regular History in the Headlines events, a series of conversations about a variety of issues related to health and disease in response to the current COVID situation. For our second episode, I am joined uh, today by my colleague, Professor Mark Anderson, a historian of ancient Rome, in particular the later Rome Empire, his current book project, Hospitals, Guest Houses, and Poor Shelters, a Late Ancient Health and Welfare System, explores the creation of a Mediterranean-wide health and welfare system of public and private care through the establishment of a variety of institutions that provided food, shelter, medical care, and more. So really a perfect fit for our series today. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great. So, Mark, tell us, how did pre-modern people understand contagion? Well, pre-modern people, to start with, knew nothing about microbiology. No microscopes, no uh, awareness that there are living organisms that actually cause diseases. So they knew nothing about viruses or bacteria as the agents of disease. However, they did know that infectious diseases could be spread by human contact which is exactly where we get our word contagion, which is from a Latin verb meaning to be in contact with. Now, ancient and medieval pandemics spread mostly in cities. They still spread that way today, but um, overwhelmingly so in the ancient world. That's where the dense populations were. So the simplest thing to do was either to leave the city yourself or prevent potentially sick people, sick people from getting inside. So to leave the city yourself, if you had a villa in the countryside, you could go off and wait it out over the course of the summer. If any of you has ever been exposed to um, Boccaccio's wonderful volume, The Decameron, that's the setting. It's 10 wealthy aristocrats uh, from Florence that leave the city during the bubonic plague. But really that option is only there for the very rich um, who have places to go outside of the city. Most of the population is stuck there. So the other option was trying to keep people uh, who might be sick out of your city. Sometimes that involved closing the gate one very common thing, again, during the bubonic plague in the 14th century, was to uh, hold ships in the harbor to prevent any new ship that's come to dock um, at your city from uh, keep the sailors from leaving and keep them from unloading for 40 days. 40 days, that's actually um, the, the word for 40 in medieval Italian is where we get our word for quarantine. So ancient and medieval people did know about contagion. They did know uh, and in fact invented the process of quarantine. It's really interesting. It makes me think of um, all of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the people who started to flee the city of New York and go to summer houses and the concern yep. that that um, gave rise to in places like Rhode Island um, and mm -hmm. the desire then, of course, to quarantine New Yorkers as they went to either Rhode Island or the Cape or Florida. They were participating uh, in an ancient tradition. Right, exactly. Yes. So um, you work uh, on, on institutions. Um, how were hospitals first developed in the ancient world? All right. So hospitals, uh, they were actually not developed until the period of the later Roman Empire, which, all things considered, is rather late in human history. Um, your healthcare network, if you were an ancient person prior to that time, was your family. Hands down, those are the people who are gonna provide your healthcare as an infant, young adult, and as an elderly person. In addition, you might have the local midwife, uh, a local healer, somebody who's knowledgeable in your village. Professional physicians did exist, but they were for the wealthy, because you have to pay them usually rather a lot if they have a reputation for being good. And in any case, professional physicians, midwives, all these other folks, they made house calls. They didn't have public institutions that they practiced at, where you could go to find them. And it's important to note that these early hospitals had as much to do with care for the poor as they did with healthcare. These two things are fully intertwined in the ancient world. That's why there's a strong etymological connection between the word hospital and the word hospitality, still in English. Early hospitals were places that provided hospitality to the needy, and that hospitality often included, in addition to a place to uh, sleep, um, a square meal. It included some at least basic medical care. So citizens of the Roman Empire in the fourth century CE, they created hospitals and poor shelters essentially at the same time, and the, the terminology for them is interchangeable. 
Uh, they created them as welfare institutions for the public good, and they did this as a uh, religious activity. Christians and Jews were both commanded to care for the poor in their scriptures, and it was under the Christian Roman Empire from the fourth century on that uh, people had the monetary um, resources and the legal sanction to care for the poor in an institutional way and on an unprecedented scale. So one of the things they did is invent, instead of distributing their goods, collected food and money out to people, it's not especially mm -hmm. efficient, they could build a location where the poor of a particular community could come together and they started to call them by these names. So I've collected documentation for hundreds of these institutions around the Mediterranean and in Southwest Asia. Uh, they varied greatly in size and quality. Some of them employed the best physicians of the day and they could treat hundreds of people at a time. Others offered little more than a bed and a square meal and some basic nursing care to just a few people at a time out on the country road. So that's really interesting about um, the hospital as a place that cares not necessarily primarily for the sick, but us, but really for the poor. So what role then did hospitals play in, in pre-modern healthcare, um, both in general, but then also in, in terms of epidemics in particular? So the early hospitals that we're talking about here focused on healing injuries, on caring for patients with chronic illnesses, and on giving homeless people, whether they're ill or not, temporary lodging. So from the evidence that we have available, early hospitals do not appear to have been centers of care during pandemics. And actually, when you think about it, this makes kind of a lot of sense. Uh, contagion is based on close human contacts. Ancients and moderns both know this. But there was no germ theory in any of these early hospitals. So if you go to a place with a whole lot of other sick people who are contagious, and you lack anything like what we would consider sanitation, or sanitation procedures, well, realistically, everyone just from their observation is gonna recognize that these are the last places you wanna be during an epidemic or pandemic um, in the ancient medieval worlds. Unfortunately, we haven't fully resolved this problem even in modern hospitals. There's still a tension. These are the locations where you have the best available healthcare, but by congregating contagious people, even with the best that we can do to maintain sanitary conditions, there are always slip ups and there's a chance you'll catch an infection at a hospital, even though you really do need to be there um, for particular kinds of care. Yes, which of course then is why they went to the countryside, right? Rather than right. to the, the hospital. Um, yeah, better not to get it in the first place and leave than to right. feel sick and then go to one of these early hospitals. Yeah. Right, and that carries through all the way. I mean, you mentioned the germ theory. That, of course, carries mm -hmm. through all the way up to the, through the germ theory and, and Semmelweis and Lister's work on, on antisep the antiseptic principle, um, mm -hmm. where the idea that Absolutely. the hospital was actually a quite deadly place, right? It wasn't it the be. place you wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, at least from my perspective, it seems like we often see the ancient world and the medieval world, uh, at least medieval Europe, depicted in a lot of different forms of popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of the, the uh, movies about antiquity, television shows, you know, even Game of Thrones, right, if we're thinking about medieval culture or an imagined medieval world. Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have in part from this kind of popular culture mm -hmm. about health and illness uh, in the pre-modern world? I think that the biggest misconception people have about healthcare, at least in late antiquity, it's the fourth to the seventh century, and that's the uh, period that my research focuses on, um, and then really the pre-modern world in general up to about the 15th, 16th century, uh, is that the development of healthcare simply stagnated during those centuries. Mm -hmm. That the ancient Greeks had some pretty cool ideas and nobody really did anything with them for a millennium and a half. And now it's certainly true that the pace of innovation was much slower than it has been since the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Um, but we can clearly point out major advances when you start looking at history and its longer uh, chunks and the invention of the hospital in late antiquity was a major example of an important step forward in the provision of public health, even if it's not a major technical innovation in the treatment of disease. For example, people can survive many diseases without modern drugs if they are provided with food, water, a clean and comfortable place to sleep, conditions that allow their immune systems to function effectively. People didn't have such places in classical antiquity if they were cut off from their family units, if they were homeless. Mm 
but by virtue of these institutions in late antiquity in the Middle Ages, they did, and that um, clearly improved their survival rates, even without major advances in the actual medical treatment that they were receiving. So while early hospitals never functioned so far as we can tell as medical teaching centers leading to the innovations in disease control that we see today, they laid the institutional foundation for modern hospitals to function in that way in the present. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting the way in which the hospital is, is so much about providing a kind of social welfare net um, mm -hmm. that enables health uh, even more in some ways that it is treating specific illnesses, right? right. Um, so rather than focus on the, the mitigation of illness, it's much more about fostering health and, um, and uh, you know, uh, through nutrition and shelter and all mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah they always, the, the founders and the people who work in them use the refrain of caring for the needy. And by that, they mean the whole range of activities that we've discussed, of which medicine wasn't one isolated thing, the way it tends to be in modern hospitals. You wouldn't send somebody who's spending the night out on the street to a hospital per se, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't send somebody who's, you know, uh, has an acute illness to a homeless shelter. That would be a confusion of categories for us, but for the um, late ancient people, they were really two sides of the same coin. Coin. Yeah, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, although, it, and it also kind of makes me think about the ways in which I, uh, county hospitals and public hospitals sometimes do become that place right. um, where it, ER is at least, right? Become yes. a place sometimes that provide that kind of shelter, um, especially yeah. perhaps for the, the homeless. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that our modern intellectual distinction there is probably overly fine and that we really would do well to reimagine both of these spaces as overlapping in that sense with the mm -hmm. health and welfare um, aspects because it's often it's the same population that needs both. Right, right, right. So, um, you know, I think many people think about the study of the distant past uh, as perhaps less relevant for our world today. Um, as historians, we, of course, obviously think that's a misnomer and incorrect. Mm -hmm. But how can studying the pre-modern world, in particular, you know, some of the work that you're doing, really open up uh, new perspectives, different perspectives uh, on the more recent past and on the, the present? So I guess I would start by reminding our viewers that the distant past is with us at every moment. So we may think that it's less relevant, but it is the background of how we got here. So for example, in just the last few minutes, we've learned where important words that are all over the news and our vocabulary uh, today come from, contagion, quarantine, hospital, um, and they're all rooted in that distant past. The Patterns of history in the pre-modern world also provide important lessons regarding the steps that have been taken in similar situations in the past. We see that late ancient people saw a need for public institutions to care for the, those who are fall through the cracks in their increasingly populated cities. And we see that over centuries, they never went back. They, are, in fact, they only built more of these and more sophisticated institutions. And if you go back far enough, I think, you learn how most aspects of our society are intimately connected. As in today's lesson that hospitals and homeless shelters arose in the same place and at the same time to care for the most vulnerable uh, individuals around us and to restore their dignity. We can see um, connections among um, categories that we might think are absolutely separate in the modern world because as our world gets more complex, we have to separate things out. But it's great to be reminded when the world was smaller, um, how things were closer together and how different aspects of our society can inform each other to, I think, their mutual benefit. You know, I'm thinking about Los Angeles and the homeless problem that we have in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We might be um, well served by collapsing some of those categories as well, right? Think and so. thinking in a more holistic way about um, the vulnerable and mm -hmm. uh, human dignity uh, and how we, we care for members of our community, um, yeah. definitely. Well, Mark, thank you very much for taking time to join us today uh, to talk about viruses and public health in the ancient uh, and medieval world or in the pre-modern world. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for turning in, tuning in. Uh, we will be back next week uh, with Professor Marnie Campbell to talk about uh, why black health matters. Thanks, and thank you again, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much.